Thomas Cahill is a well-known, uh, famous historian. He's written a number of popular uh, historical works. Uh, you might have heard of How the Irish Saved Civilization, for instance. He also wrote The Gift of the Jews and a number of other works. He, he made a comment about Christianity some years ago that I thought was interesting, or about the church in particular. And he said this, Many Christians, especially higher clergy, are concerned only with the strength of Christianity as an institution, something Jesus showed no interest in, he writes. They show little concern for the success of the gospel of peace and love. Christianity comes in two different packages, official and real. Official Christianity is doing pretty well, with a head count that is several hundred million more than its nearer, nearest competitors, Islam and Buddhism. But there is the question of what the content of Christianity is, and whether Christians truly subscribe to this content. Feed the hungry, clothe the naked, shelter the homeless, comfort the afflicted. Here, the results are much more spotty writes Thomas Cahill. Now, I, I want to immediately say in response to this that there is also theological content in Christianity. Christianity is not merely philanthropy. It's also a theology. It's a series of convictions and beliefs. But even as I say that, I don't want to dismiss Thomas Cahill's argument, which I think is, by and large, absolutely correct. There oftentimes, it seems, is a distinction between two types of Christianity, official and real, the institution and the reality of a genuine movement started by the Lord Jesus Christ that would continue his mission here on the earth. One of the most difficult aspects of, quote, real Christianity for the church to come to terms with is the aspect of truly loving, reaching, going after, and offering forgiveness to lost people and to people that society at large may deem undesirable for any number of reasons. There are any number of categories like this that the church struggles to engage and reach with the gospel of Christ. And this is a problem that goes back to the very beginning, as we'll see in our text this evening. In Matthew chapter 9, we'll be looking particularly at verses 9 through 13, we see the call of Levi, who we know more commonly as Matthew. And the call of Levi is interesting because Levi, we are told, is a tax collector. In other words, he was a despised person by Jewish society. He was an undesirable. And yet, Jesus goes to Matthew, and calls him to be his disciple. So I want to unpack what the real heart of the gospel is, the offer of mercy and love to the, quote, undeserving. And I want to argue that, of course, rightly seen, that is all of us. We are all Matthew. So Matthew chapter 9, verses 9 through 13, as Jesus passed on from there, he saw a man called Matthew sitting at the tax booth, and he said to him, follow me. And he rose and followed him. And as Jesus reclined at table in the house, behold, many tax collectors and sinners came and were reclining with Jesus and his disciples. And when the Pharisees saw this, they said to his disciples, why does your teacher eat with tax collectors and sinners? But when he, Jesus, heard it, he said, those who are well have no need of a physician, but those who are sick. Go and learn what this means. I desire mercy and not sacrifice, for I came not to call the righteous, but sinners. This is a fascinating text and a, and a critically important text because it shows us the heart of Jesus. It also is one of those places where he gives a very, very clear um, expression of his mission and purpose, what he came to do. And that means by extension, he is giving us our mission and purpose because we are his body, as the New Testament will say. We are the body and bride of Christ. So let's unpack this. 
the calling of Matthew, the calling of Levi, and what this means. The first thing we see in this is what I'm going to call a most unlikely disciple. Matthew was an unlikely disciple, certainly by societal standards of the time and probably by standards of today as well. The tax man has never been one of the more popular people. But you've got to understand that in a situation like 2,000 years ago in Palestine, this was a situation of, um, of hostility and of um, foreign control. The Roman Empire controlled this region. So it meant that a Jewish tax collector was in some ways seen as being cooperative with an oppressive power. Craig Keener lays out the problem with tax collectors and how they were viewed very well. He points out that, quote, the common people and non-aristocratic pietists despise tax gatherers as agents of the Romans and their aristocratic pawns. Perhaps something, Keener writes, like what the Dutch or French felt toward local collaborators with the Nazis, or what Africans felt toward Slates, which were the African assistants to European slave traders. Then Keener lays out, in kind of a sequential order, some of the problems. The average Jewish person in ancient Palestine had several reasons to dislike tax collectors. First, Palestine's local Jewish aristocracies undoubtedly arranged for this collection. So it's not just that it was just the tax collector with the Roman authorities above him. They were also doing the bidding of the, the wealthy and the powerful within Jewish society, the aristocrats. Second, the empire sometimes had to take precautions to keep tax gatherers from overcharging people, which suggests that some tax gatherers did just that. Some also beat people to get their money. Further, nearly all scholars concur that taxes were exorbitant, even without overcharges. In some parts of the empire, Keener writes, taxation was so oppressive that laborers fled their land, at times to the point that entire villages were depopulated. And here's his concluding comments on tax collectors. Matthew's office would have made him locally prominent, possibly as a customs official. Customs officers demanded written declarations of travelers' possessions and searched baggage. They may have collected some other government revenues as well. Some Jewish texts condemn customs officers as well as other tax gatherers, though some such officials appear to have become benefactors to local populations. One of the things that we've got to understand as well is that tax collectors, in addition to the exorbitant taxes that uh, they help execute and levy against the population, their commission was whatever they could get out of people above and beyond that. So a scrupulous, uh, an unscrupulous, excuse me, tax collector could find creative ways to really, really tighten the screws on people and oppress them and extort them to, to an amazing extent. By the way, Josephus points out that Herod Antipas, when we uh, try to calculate the modern equivalent of how much annual taxes Herod Antipas was getting from his taxable regions, it comes out to about five million dollars each year. So this is the man that Jesus, or who Jesus calls to be his disciple, Matthew. Think of how despised Matthew must have been. A Jew profiting off the backs of oppressed Jews helping the aristocrats of his own land, who were living quite comfortably, and helping, worst of all, the Romans. I mean, this, this is just unfathomable that Jesus would call this man to follow him. But he does. As Jesus passed on from there, he saw a man called Matthew sitting at the tax booth. So even when Jesus encounters him, he's busy with his dastardly work. He's sitting at the booth, and Jesus said to him, follow me, and he rose and followed him. You know what I like about this? I love the fact that whereas everyone else who walked by that booth, every Jewish person, would have looked with scorn at Matthew. I mean, how many insults every day 
must Matthew have suffered? Not without reason, I might add. I mean, probably you and I would have felt the same way. But how many insults, how many harsh words, how many, how many facial expressions of disgust? How many people did he see take a wide berth around him so they wouldn't have to come by him for fear that he would hit them up for more tax revenue? And yet, whereas everyone else sees a despised person, Jesus sees one of his great disciples. Jesus sees a follower. I mean, th this distinction that Cahill makes between official and real Christianity is important. It often seems that throughout the history of the church over the last 2,000 years, institutional Christianity has been as susceptible to cronyism and nepotism and, and uh, prid, uh, quid pro quo, excuse me, uh, you scratch my back, I'll scratch yours, uh, politics. Um, it seems that there are people who profit off of the backs of God's people in the name of God. Jude, in his little book, uh, next to last book in the New Testament, condemns these kind of religious leaders. In other words, it seems like institutional Christianity, when it achieves a great deal of wealth and clout, begins to there, there begins to develop a kind of caste system where there are the desirables and the undesirables. But that is not real Christianity. Real Christianity is ever and always looking at the, quote, despised person and seeing a potential follower of Jesus. It's, it's the religious authorities with their pomp and circumstance who turn up their noses at people like Matthew. But it is not Christians. Christians who are really following Jesus, their first instinct when they see someone who people don't like or someone who is considered to be an enemy, our first instinct ought to be that man, that woman, could be an amazing follower of Jesus Christ if he or she would come to Christ. Jesus looks at Matthew and sees what he can be. You and I in our flesh tend to look at people and just see what we think they are. Except for when it comes to ourselves. We're all very grateful that God shows mercy to us. We know what we are capable of for ill or for bad. And yet God is merciful to us. And yet sometimes we don't extend that same sense of hope and optimism and mercy to others so Matthew is a most unlikely disciple. And by the way, Jesus seemed to really traffic in scandalizing people by the people that he lifted up. Um, think, per perhaps most notably, the, uh, the story of the Good Samaritan. The fact that Jesus makes a despised Samaritan the hero of that story, whereas the official religious leaders are seen to be the the goats of the story, the heels of the story. It's just such a classic Jesus move. He's always catching us off, us off guard by who gets his attention, who he goes to. And oftentimes it's those who are considered very unlikely to be followers of Jesus. So, in Matthew, we see a most unlikely disciple, someone that everyone else would have moved away from. Jesus moves towards. Please forgive me, I'm having bad allergies today. Secondly, in addition to a most unlikely disciple, we see a most ironic blindness. The reaction of the Pharisees shows them to be blind to the spiritual realities at play in Jesus' extension of mercy to undesirable people, quote-unquote. And so it's ironic that the Pharisees are so blind to this because as religious authorities and leaders, they should have been most attuned to the heart of God, but they weren't. So look at verse 10. And as Jesus reclined at table in the house, behold, many tax collectors come. So <clears throat> first of all, back in verse 9, Jesus goes to Matthew sitting at the tax booth. He says, follow me, and he rose and followed him. And then in verse 10, it says, as Jesus reclined at table in the house. It's traditionally been thought 
that, quote, the house is Matthew's house. And, and it needs to be understood that when it says reclined at table, this, uh, and I believe it is uh, perhaps Luke's account of this, one of the other Gospels makes it clear that this is not merely a meal. This is a feast. And by the way, the fact that Matthew says in verse 10 that they reclined at table shows that it is a feast. Um, actually, first century Jews tended to sit in chairs, is what many archaeologists and historians argue, but reclining was more of a luxurious posture. They would do this as well, but at feasts and things like this. As Jesus reclined at table in the house, behold, many tax collectors and sinners came and reclining with Jesus and his disciples. So get the scandal of this moment. It's not just the scandal that Jesus calls a tax collector to follow him. It's also the scandal that he then has a feast, a meal, essentially a party with Matthew's friends. I mean, this would have been a despised group of people, but notice that it's, quote, Jesus and his disciples. And when the Pharisees saw this, they said to each other, they, they said to his disciples, why does your teacher eat with tax collectors and sinners? Well, that's the question, isn't it? Why does Jesus associate with these bad people, tax collectors? I mean, if you wanted to, to try to build a following in first century Palestine, this would be about the worst possible way to do it, to, 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 to saddle up bes bes beside tax collectors and and uh, women of, of bad reputation and show them mercy, prostitutes, tax collectors, and sinners, and Samaritans, and all these people. The disciple, the Pharisees are scandalized, and they say to the disciples, why does your teacher eat with tax collectors? Now, the New Testament scholar Frank Stagg points out that the word Pharisee means separated, one separated from unclean people. And things. So in a sense, they are living up to their names. But as I said earlier, in another sense, these men should know better. They, they were men who should have known the heart of God. So this is a fascinating situation. Now, it, this, this situation of Jesus eating and dining with sinners has become controversial in our own day. Uh, you still see manifestations of this. I think, for instance, of, uh, I believe it was the Missouri Baptist Convention, maybe, I don't know, 10, 11 years ago, something like that. Some church planners, I believe it, it was, were they were um, starting a Bible study um, in one of the cities of Missouri, and they were trying to reach people. But what, th what they did was they started a Bible study in a bar. It was pastors and Christians. I mean, I think it was maybe seven, eight, nine, ten folks but they decided they would have their Bible study in a bar. And so they got a table at the bar with the, the owner of the bar's blessing, and they would bring their Bibles and have a Bible study, and their hope was that the people in the bar would see them, maybe have interest. They were trying to go where people were. Now, that set off just a huge debate, as you might imagine. There were, there were Christians who were just incensed about this. It, it's inappropriate. You shouldn't be in a bar. Your presence there can be a stumbling block to others, etc., etc. I get that going to where people are can be scandalous. And I suppose in theory there are right and wrong ways to do this. But let me just say that stories like Matthew's, the, the call of Matthew, and then Jesus eating with the tax collectors and scandalizing the religious authorities, at least tells me this, that if we do what Jesus did, there will be times when the religious people who are concerned with cleanliness will be scandalized by our sincere efforts to reach sinners. I am inclined to side with people who, with good intention, go to take light to darkness, go to reach people with the gospel of Jesus Christ. I remember we took a mission trip to Seattle 
know, here at Central Baptist Church a number of years ago. It was a long, long time ago, maybe five years ago, something like that, four or five years ago. And the church plant was meeting in a nightclub because it was almost literally, and people overuse that word, but it, it appears that it was the only place they could get permission to meet. The, the church planner at the time told me that in, in Seattle, which was not, is not a place that is overly um, open arms towards church plants, that he and his church, which our church supported, uh, had been turned down. They had tried to meet in various places and had been told no or turned down. I think it was something like 50 or 60 times. It was a really shocking number. So they found someone who owned a nightclub. It was a nightclub, and it had a big bar in it and all of this. And these folks said, yeah, on Sundays, y'all can come in here, set up your Sunday school, have your church service. No one's here. It's not open. And they did that. And so I remember that uh, we went up there, and I just remember the, the, just the strange feeling of church in a nightclub. Well, I'll, I'll be perfectly honest with you. I was good with it. I mean, what are you going to say? I, I think that God is, is very open and desirous for his people to be light in the darkness, to, to shine. And that may mean being in some places that the, the very religious might say, hey, you shouldn't be. Notice I'm drawing a distinction between religion and following Jesus. I think those are two very separate things. So I would ask you this. Are your efforts to reach lost people taking you out of your comfort zone? I don't ever mean joining people in, in their sinful behavior, of course. And that seems to be the concern with some of these things. I'm talking about going where people are so that we can engage and get to know them. Now, many Christians will look at a passage like this and say, yes, Jesus ate with tax collectors, but he did so in order to reach and change them. I don't disagree with that in principle. Obviously, Jesus, as the light of the world, was proclaiming the kingdom in his very person, much less in his words and, and everything that he said and did and his works of miraculous power. But I don't think that that fact should be used to soften the scandal of this, that Jesus is reclining at a feast with people with bad reputations, getting to know them. He's forming relationships. Yes, he is speaking of the kingdom. So, this is something that the church continues to wrestle with today. I would propose this. I would propose that with care and caution to make sure, once again, that we are not joining with people in behavior that is not what Christians ought to be doing in terms of your actual behavior, but that we do follow Jesus to where people are and try to reach people with the gospel of Christ even if going there offends, quote, the religious people. I think of a ministry in Arkansas that I heard about uh, maybe a few years ago. There are, there are a group of ladies in, in Arkansas, and there's a name for this ministry, and I believe it's in other states as well. They minister to and try to reach women who work at clubs, these dancers, and this group of Christian women will go into these clubs and take care packages. They get permission to go talk to the, the women who work at these places. They try to minister to them. They try to help them get out of that lifestyle. They try to connect them with the church, et cetera, et cetera. Now, I hear that, and I think that's fantastic. Good for these women. I mean, what a, what a bold, brave, incarnational mission and ministry that is. So, it is a most ironic blindness that the religious leaders failed to see. All they saw was the scandal of the tax collector, 
and they missed the saving mercy of the Savior. And that leads us to our third point, which is this. It's a most scandalous mission. The mission of Christ is scandalous. Jesus' words to the Pharisees, these words are just awesome, and they're, and they're biting and cutting against self-righteousness. But when he heard it, that is, when Jesus heard that they were scandalized by this, why is he eating with these tax collectors? He said, those who are well have no need of a physician, but those who are sick. Again, this is a clear articulation of, of Jesus' mission and ministry. He is a physician, and he's come for the sick. Spoiler alert, that's all of us, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. But when Jesus says, it's not the well who have, it, the, those who are well have no need of a physician, he's not proposing that there are people who are well. I think he's being ironic. The point is, no one's well. The point is, the Pharisees are no better than these tax collectors. But then, Jesus ups the ante even more. I love this. Verse 13. Jesus, now speaking to the religious leaders, the Pharisees, which is one of the groups or classes of religious authorities, go and learn what this means. I desire mercy and not sacrifice, for I have come, for I came not to call the righteous but sinners. Jesus quotes Hosea 6.6 6 to the Pharisees. This is what Hosea 6.6 6 says. For I desire steadfast love and not sacrifice, the knowledge of God rather than burnt offerings. What God prioritizes then is not religion, it's love. These men were concerned, back to Cahill's distinction between official Christianity and real Christianity, I know they were Jewish Pharisees, but to put it in our parallel, they were concerned with official Judaism, institutional Judaism. Jesus was demonstrating the true loving heart of God. But notice in verse 13 that Jesus says to the Pharisees, and this is, uh, this is bold, this is good, go and learn what this means. I desire mercy and not sacrifice. Many commentators believe that he's essentially saying to these guys, have you not read this? You need to go read your Bibles. <laughs> to say that to the Pharisees was just, I mean, Jesus had an amazing way of just pouring fuel on the fire. I mean, they're already ticked. And then he says, maybe you should go read your Bibles. Because if you read your Bibles, you'll read Hosea 6.6. 6, I desire steadfast love and not sacrifice. Craig Keener makes a, a powerful statement. He says, early Jewish literature indicates that for all Judaism's emphasis on mercy and repentance, Jesus' act of actively pursuing sinners was virtually unheard of. It is thus not surprising, he writes, that it appears scandalous. Meaning, meaning, Israel had a theology of repentance, but it was not accustomed to this sort of personalized, activistic approach of sinners by someone. Jesus actually going and eating with tax collectors. It's one thing to have the words on the book. It's another thing when someone starts living it out. And I, I've discovered this in my own life as a Christian. I see it in my own life as well sometimes. We know what the scriptures say. But when someone actually starts to do it, everyone gets a little bit nervous. Someone who actually sells all that they have and give it to the poor. It's like, well, wait a minute. Someone who literally turns the other cheek when someone slaps or punches, punches them. Again, the difference between real and official Christianity. Jesus is real. There's one more thing here that's just powerful, and it's the language. It's what Jesus says. When he heard this, he said, those who are well have no need of a physician, but those who are sick. Then he quotes Hosea 6, 6. Go and learn what this means. I desire mercy and not sacrifice. For I came to call the righteous and not sinners. The word mercy there is the word hesed. Now, recently, Michael Card has written an entire book on hesed. He's written an entire book on this one word. And this is something he's done a lot of work in. Hesed is a word, he argues, that's essentially untranslatable. 
This is what Michael Card says about this. I want you to listen closely. It'll help you understand what's at play here. The Old Testament word for mercy, which is in Hosea 6.6 6 and elsewhere, is the Hebrew word hesed. This word describes the very heart of God and is used 250 times in the Old Testament. It is an untranslatable word like love. It can properly be understood only by being incarnated. It can properly be understood only by being incarnated. And this is what Jesus has come to do. The creators of the King James Version, Card writes, had to invent a new word to attempt to translate the untranslatable hesed. They came up with the compound word loving kindness. So the word loving kindness was a new word that the King James translators had to come up with to try to express the otherwise inexpressible concept of hesed. Card concludes, the best translation I know requires an entire sentence. And I believe this is Card's own translation. This is what he says hesed means. You ready for this? When the person from whom I have a right to expect... <clears throat> Excuse me. Let me start that over. When the person from whom I have a right to expect nothing gives me everything. When the person from whom I have a right to expect nothing gives me everything. Hesed. Mercy. This is the ministry of Jesus Christ. A most unlikely disciple, Matthew. A most ironic blindness, the Pharisees. A most scandalous mission, Jesus. When the person from whom I have a right to expect nothing gives me everything. Matthew had no right to expect anything from anyone, much less Jesus. But Jesus gave him everything. And guys, listen, that is what Jesus does for you and me. But it's not just that that's what Jesus does for us. It's also that that is the life to which we are called. We are to be agents of Hesed, to give everything to the person who has no right to expect anything. That's mercy. That's grace. Homework this week. When God gives you an opportunity this week, and I bet he will, because I think he does it to all of us all the time, offers these to us. When God gives you an opportunity to show hesed, undeserved mercy, give it, show it, offer it. That is what Jesus does, what he has done, what he is doing, what he will do. Because that is who Jesus is. Show the hesed of God. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for mercy. It is a sweet and undeserved gift. And we say thank you. God, we thank you that though we have no right to expect anything, you have given us everything. Father, I pray for the person who might be watching this who doesn't know you. I pray that right now they would receive your hesed, your mercy, your loving kindness that they would call on your name in faith and say, Jesus, forgive me, save me, give me mercy. Father, we love you, but we know we love you because you first loved us. Thank you, because we are Matthew. We are the, quote, undesirable one, the bad one, the one sitting at the tax booth. That's us. But you see us and see followers, and you call us. And Father, we would follow Jesus. Help us to follow Jesus. We love you. We pray all of this in the name of Christ. Amen. Well, guys, it's been good to be together. I'm sorry I had a 30-something minute allergy attack through this whole thing. Sorry I had to keep itching my nose, and I apologize for that. At least I didn't break out into a huge horrible sneezing fit but anyway i'm gonna go take some benadryl love all of you guys we'll see you next week